So one issue that comes up a lot is where does the value actually come from in terms of a cryptocurrency? You know, for example, Bitcoin. Many people believe that the value is zero. And the idea is that Bitcoin doesn't pay any dividends. So it's got no cash flows. Uh, it's not backed by anything. It's a computer program. So how can it have value? So I think that it's really important to distinguish between tangible value and intangible value. And let me explore this. So the story that I like to tell my students is the story of the Iraqi Swiss dinar. And maybe you don't know uh, this particular tale, uh, and I will explore it uh, for you. So the Iraqi dinar was the currency of Iraq until the first Gulf War in 1990. Now, it turns out that Iraq and Saddam Hussein had outsourced the, uh, the printing of the dinar. And it's called the Iraqi Swiss dinar because the printing plates were manufactured in Switzerland and the actual production or the printing of the currency was done in the UK. So in 1991, at the end of the war, Iraq was split into two pieces. So um, in the south, uh, Saddam Hussein controlled uh, Iraq in the, in the north, the Kurds. And then a number of sanctions were, imp were uh, imposed on Iraq. So one issue with the sanction was that it was impossible for the UK to export the freshly printed dinars to, uh, to Iraq. So Saddam Hussein had to scramble and develop his own printing facility uh, in Iraq to print a new uh, currency. So that actually happened. And the idea um, was that an edict went out from the Central Bank of Iraq and citizens were given three weeks to exchange the old dinars, which I'll call the Iraqi Swiss dinar, for the new uh, dinar, which I will sometimes call the Saddam uh, dinar. So this is pretty important, that citizens had to transfer to go to the bank to exchange for the new dinar, because if they didn't do this in three weeks, the old dinar would not be legal tender. It would be worthless. Okay, so, so people basically did this uh, in the south, but this didn't apply to the north. So the north uh, was basically separate. So there was no uh, central bank of Iraq that had any influence there. So, so basically uh, what happened was the Kurds in the north just decided to continue using the Iraqi Swiss dinar. So to be clear, that dinar has got no value according to the Central Bank of Iraq. But it was used as if it did have value. Now, this is especially interesting that uh, Saddam Hussein in the South was desperate for money to pay for various things, and they decided to inflate. So they kept on printing the new dinars. And at some point, the exchange rate was 300 of the Saddam dinars for one of the old, unbacked Iraqi Swiss uh, dinars. Okay, so the point I'm making here is that it is possible to have value even though the currency isn't necessarily backed by anything. Okay, and this is uh, a recent example, but 
it's not the only example uh, in history. So the Iraqi Swiss dinar uh, continued uh, to be used, uh, and, and it had value even though technically it was unbacked by the central bank of Iraq. There's many other examples in history, and uh, perhaps the, the most famous one are a stone currency from the, uh, the island of Yap in the South Pacific. Uh, indeed, uh, these failed on the portability uh, sort of dimension that I mentioned in terms of a characteristic of currency. But again, these stones really didn't have any fundamental value, but they were used. And that economy thrived in its time. So the message here is that we need to recognize the difference between tangible and intangible uh, value. So uh, gold, as I mentioned, a gold coin has got tangible value. Uh, the U.S. currency, even though it's not backed by gold since 1971, it has got some value in that uh, the government can tax you and you need to pay uh, in U.S. dollars. It, it's got tangible value because it's legal tender and must be accepted. It's got tangible value because uh, if you violate not accepting the dollar or, uh, or something like that, then you could be incarcerated. But it's also important to think about intangible value. Indeed, our economy today is built upon intangible value. We used to be a manufacturing economy. We're no longer a manufacturing uh, economy in the U.S. Much of the value that's created is intangible. And given that we're more than willing to assign value to companies that have, um, you know, IP, research and development, patents, um, specialized software, trademarks, customer lists. Given we're willing to assign value there for these intangibles, then I think it makes it easier to make the case that intangible value is very important for uh, crypto uh, space in general. So when we come to today, um, decentralized finance is going to enable efficient peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the centralized institution. We will deal with an idea throughout the four courses of tokenization of almost anything. This goes well beyond Bitcoin and Ethereum. And the possibility of an efficient barter mechanism so again, remember this, that one of the themes in this course is that decentralized finance actually opens up the possibility of returning to barter, but in a much more efficient way. So next, uh, we'll talk about uh, some of the problems with decentralized finance.